Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are moving into a new topic um, for this module, and that is race and ethnicity. Um, and I'd like to explore a wide variety of, of things, including, um, first and foremost, the evidence against biological race. So if you remember from our earlier weeks, anthropology is a holistic discipline. And that means that when we study something like race, um, we want to understand it not just from the cultural and societal perspective, um, but also from the biological perspective, the use of language, you know, archaeological evidence. We're incorporating all of these methods so that we get a broad understanding of this concept. Um, now, race is not a biological uh, thing. It's, we're not capable of categorizing or breaking our species down um, into biological racial groups. And um, that's an important place to start with this discussion because not a lot of people realize that. Um, and it is false information about race as biology that really has led to um, what anthropologists end up studying the most. And that is the oppression and discrimination against people of color, um, people of racial minorities. And so that's where we're going to start with this lecture. And I'm gonna break this PowerPoint race and ethnicity up into a couple different lectures. And the first one is going to focus on race as biology or not um, as biology. Then we're going to explore um, how race becomes biological. And I'll explain what I mean uh, in a few minutes here. Um, then we'll explore, you know, the levels of racial inequality in the U.S. and cross-culturally, why those things exist, um, you know, maybe what we can do about it. So we're going to uh, get to explore some applied anthropology in this lecture as well. So just to clarify, race and ethnicity are different things. The term ethnicity um, refers to your national, religious, and or cultural origin. So you actually may have many ethnicities. Um, and one nation can have many ethnicities. Even very homogenous nations can have many ethnicities. So an ethnicity is real, and it focuses on cultural and subcultural groups that you're a part of. So this may be national, right? Puerto Rican may be an ethnicity. Jewish may be an ethnicity. Um, the Hmong may be an ethnicity, um, you know, the Navajo, et cetera. Um, each of those are kind of distinct ethnic groups or what we might call subcultures. But what we're focusing on in this particular lecture, because of course we're going to come up against a, a wide variety of ethnicities throughout the course of the semester. In this lecture, we are focusing on the concept of race. So race is often misunderstood to be biological, but really it's a social construct. It's something that was created by culture. This is not to say that race doesn't exist biologically in other species, because it does. Um, and when it does, we might use the word subspecies or race or even breed. So um, what makes biological race real in other species is when they have distinct gene frequencies and or consistently identifiable characteristics. And I think one of the best examples of this is always going to be dog breeds. And even they're um, more complex than how I'm going to present this biologically, but think about you know a Chihuahua and a Rottweiler or a Great Dane. Um, if you always, if you're, if you're breeding Chihuahuas, 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 are you ever going to get a Great Dane? No. And if you breed Great Danes, Great Danes, Great Danes, are you ever going to get a Chihuahua? No. And that's because each of the breeds has a consistently identifiable set of characteristics and some gene frequencies. And so Chihuahuas do not have the genetic capacity to be as large as Great Danes and vice versa. Um, and this is why we call them distinct breeds. Um, we don't see that in human beings. Um, there are no clear lines um, regarding the kind of concepts of race that we have. So in the in the U.S., um, we have things like white. We have non-Hispanic white, which is actually a relatively new term um, to kind of identify people who maybe appear white, right, but um, have Hispanic background. The government wants to know and count those for some reason. You know, Black, African American, Hispanic, which really actually means to speak Spanish, um, you know, Latino. Uh, we need kind of lump 
groups together, uh, a couple groups together in the Hispanic arena. Then we have Asian, which is this enormous one because of course it includes the entire continent of Asia with everything from Mongolia to Russia, to Thailand, uh, to the South Pacific islands. And, and ultimately um, all indigenous people in North Central and South America um, are a Asian as well, right? Because they, um, you know, the ancestors migrated over the Bering Strait from Asia. So that's an enormously large um, group. Uh, and, and those groups, as we're going to see, are really more cultures, right? Um, and that's how anthropologists study race from the perspective of, of humanity. We have not been able to find any, you know, distinct gene frequencies between populations. Um, and there's other reasons why biological race doesn't work for our species that I'm going to get to here in a moment. Um, but first, let me introduce the perspective on race that, as anthropologists, we studied. Um, so, from a cultural perspective, race refers to groups of people who have differences and similarities in physical traits, and here's where it gets important, that are deemed by society to be, to, society to be socially significant, meaning that people treat other people differently because of them. And in the United States and in many cultures in the world, um, it is skin color. Uh, that kind of is a is a marker to to put people into different racial groups, and we'll see the problem with that here in a moment. But note that um, from this perspective, race is culturally created, and it's the things that are deemed by society to be important that are kind of focused on when we're identifying people as different races. You know, interestingly, race is a relatively new concept. Um, when we look at ancient societies, ancient Mesopotamia, um, ancient Egypt, the earliest civilizations did not use skin color or racial classifications. Um, they did have stratification, of course, predominantly by wealth. And then as religion, because of course, um, you know, slavery itself actually predates the racial categories we know today. The earliest known mass slavery um, was of Jewish people. So, um, you know, slavery as we understand it in the United States, the more recent version of that um, is probably where these racial concepts come from. So the racial categories that we have today um, developed, we believe as anthropologists, um, primarily out of slavery uh, as justification to prevent freedom during old and new world colonialism. And it, it gets a little bit deeper here because, um, you know, there are, uh, people traveling the world, Marco Polo, right? It was a world traveler, but he traveled on foot. And you don't see in these early writings, these kind of racist depictions of indigenous populations the way that you do during colonial times. And anthropologists believe that's because um, of something called gradation. So um, we're actually gonna see this in the next couple slides here, but you'll notice if I skip forward, um, what I mean by gradation, if you can see my cursor, is note how we kind of get gradually darker as we get towards the equator, right, on both ends. That's called a gradation. Um, and so as Marco Polo was traveling down, he would have been slowly introduced to populations that had slightly darkening um, physical skin tones, and it wouldn't have been as obvious, but that European colonists were using boats. And so they would travel by boat, they would land somewhere towards the equator, and there would be a remarkable difference between physical, uh, remarkable physical differences at that time. Um, and that that may have influenced um, what ultimately will be called biological determinism. Um, so colonists used um, biological determinism or the idea that, you know, people of different races are inferior. They're inferior genetically, biologically, um, intellectually, culturally, as we're going to see, you know, throughout the course of this lecture. Um, and that that was a justification for people um, who were white colonists at that time to, you know, quote unquote, save these people. It was the white man's burden to some extent that they were inferior, that it was okay to <clears throat> enslave them because they're not human beings. Um, and when race is believed to be biological, right, biological determinism comes into play. But it can often lead to what we call eugenics. And eugenics is the um, is what we call racial purification, essentially. It's, it's the false idea that you can breed certain traits out. And so um, the most common example of this that you're probably familiar with is, of course, the Holocaust. Um, but as we're going to see uh, when we watch um, 
a film in this class called Race and Intelligence Science's Last Taboo, eugenics actually began in the United States. The concept was developed in Britain, but the United States was the first nation in the world to actively sterilize people that we didn't want to have children or to pass, pass their traits on to the next generation. Um, and they focused predominantly on marginalized populations um, and intellectual scores, IQ scores. So they would give people IQ tests and if they failed, if they did poorly, then they would be sterilized. Um, now, if you take my biology class, my biological anthropology class, you'll find out, of course, that that's not how it works. Um, you know, intelligence and a lot of the traits that we have as a species are not just single genes that you can wipe out. Um, they are uh, influenced by many genes. And so you can't, and a lot of things are kind of hiding in our genome, right? So you can't um, weed traits out like this. Um, so the, but the importance is there because if this misinformation about race as biology is leading to mass sterilization or even genocide, then we need to understand these premises more. So here's a little bit of information that I am going to give you to prove that race does not exist in our species. Um, and so here is a, a quote from your textbook, your chapter on race. Note that this is a citation, an in-text citation. Whenever you do work in this class, make sure that you're citing the author. And this is what that's going to look like. I also have an APA guide um, in the modules for you to use. So the author says, the fundamental point here is that any effort to classify human populations into racial categories is inherently arbitrary and subjective rather than scientific and objective. These racial classification schemes simply reflected their proponents' desires to slice the pie of human physical variation according to the particular trait or traits they preferred to establish as the major defining criteria of their classification system. Um, and so essentially what Shook is saying here is that there's, there's no consistent way to classify race across cultures. Um, we primarily use skin color in the United States, but skin color is not always how people classify or stratify in societies. Um, in Japan, for instance, where the population is largely Japanese, so they are relatively homogenous, very different from a very heterogeneous United States. Um, you know, there's not a lot of racial, physical, um, skin color differences. Um, and so the people that tend to be uh, most marginalized are almost always going to be the indigenous communities. Um, and so they're at the very bottom, um, not necessarily because of their skin tone, but because of where they came from, because of their backgrounds. Um, whereas, you know, in, uh, you know, previous times in Egypt, let's say, um, we saw religion being a primary influence in who was at the top and who was at the bottom, as well as wealth. Um, so if race were real, then the way that we classify race would be relatively consistent cross-culturally, and it's, it's simply not. One of the other reasons why race doesn't exist in our species is because the way that we vary, the reasons that we vary um, and how we vary is what we call continuous. Um, and that is because skin color is dependent on a lot of things. It's what we call polygenic, meaning multiple genes. Dozens of genes are involved in determining what your skin color will be, as well as environmental impact, like how much sun you're getting and where your ancestors came from. Um, and what what I mean when I say race is continuous is instead of black, white, right, you're one or the other, um, uh, skin color is fluid. So you can be anywhere along a spectrum on the skin color. And then these are the, this is the spectrum of skin tone in, in human society. So um, A1 is the very beginning. And then we can kind of move up, uh, up and up and up and all the way until we get to F11, which is considered to be the darkest skin tone. And here is my question that hopefully kind of makes race as biology a moot point. Take a moment and tell me where on this scale you stop being white and start being Asian. Or when do you stop being Hispanic and start being black African-American? Is B4 the cutoff? D8? 
you get where I'm going with this. There's no way to classify people by race. We have people who um, are African American who have African um, recent African heritage who are lighter skinned. Um, some of the darkest skin tones in the world don't even come from Africa. Um, they come from some of the highest um, altitude regions where people are literally miles closer to the sun. Um, we see some of the darkest skin tones uh, in Sri Lanka and the tip of India as well as in Australia among indigenous populations. Um, what skin color is really about is protecting our skin from the sun. And you know, skin color evolved, um, we started as dark skinned, right? And, and that has to absolutely be true because all the biological evidence, all the fossil evidence that we have, all the molecular evidence that we have suggests that human beings began in Africa, in sub-Saharan and equatorial Africa for the most part, and that dark skin would have been absolutely necessary for survival um, for a wide variety of reasons. And humans lost our hair upwards of 3 million years ago. And so we need that dark skin for protection from the sun um, to avoid the development of skin cancer. Um, keep in mind that people with dark skin do get skin cancer, um, and actually they tend to get the more virulent kinds. So, um, you know, make sure to, to wear scum, uh, sunscreen and protect yourselves. But note that this is one of the reasons that um, our skin is dark um, and that early humans were likely dark as well. But also why someone like myself who is light skinned tans in the sun, um, that is my body's kind of a reaction to too much UV radiation It's trying to protect me. So it's going to tan my skin. Um, this isn't the driving force for skin color though. Nutrients are. Um, dark skin also protects uh, the folate B, which is a necessary nutrient for cells to divide. So especially when women are pregnant, folate B is absolutely crucial. And in the UV rich areas around the equator, you're getting so much UV radiation that it's depleting your full AB. Darker skin would have prevented that. So it would have been crucial to reproduction early on. So why do we have light skin? Well, as humans leave Africa and start traveling north, suddenly um, we're looking at another nutrient that's responsible um, for skin tone, and that is the regulation of vitamin D. In equatorial areas where the UV radiation is really, really intense, dark skin is going to allow just enough UV radiation to catalyze uh, the right amount of vitamin D for your body. Vitamin D is toxic at, a, at certain levels. Think about a kind of long day you spend at the beach. You're almost always kind of exhausted, a little dehydrated, tired, maybe even dizzy, maybe nauseous. That's actually um, vitamin D poisoning. And you don't want that, right? Um, and so in these equatorial areas, dark skin would have allowed just the right amount of UV radiation into the skin for vitamin D production. But as we move north into these northern latitudes where there's more cloud coverage, there's less direct UV radiation, suddenly people with dark skin are not getting enough UV radiation and they would likely have um, started dying off in exchange for those who evolved lighter skin that allows a more absorption of that minimal UV radiation in order to catalyze the right amount of vitamin D. So your skin color is really just an evolutionary adaptation to geography and to um, you know, uh, um, regulating the right amount of nutrients that you have and protecting your skin from the sun. It means nothing else other than that historically. However, the way that we um, categorize people and all of the things that come with that have become so socially powerful that race becomes biology. And what I mean by this is um, humans, our language, our culture, we're so dependent on it that sometimes it causes our bodies to react and to respond. Um, and there may be things that are common to certain racial populations that to a small racist minority in the scientific or philosophical or social science community might say, well, look, right? There is some consistencies among racial populations and health. So race must be biological, but this is what we're going to delve into really quickly, how race appears to be biological. 
And so here's some examples of what I mean by that. If there is no biological differences between races in this country, how do you explain a mortality rate for African Americans that is 16% higher for white than for white Americans, regardless of cause? What this means is that across this country, Black African American people are going to die at a much younger age than white people, regardless of lifestyle. Second, compared with whites, Blacks in age groups that are less than 65 years had higher levels of self-reported risk factors and chronic diseases and mortality from cardiovascular diseases, cancers, and diseases that are associated with people aged 65 and over. So what this means, and this resource, by the way, um, remember there's notes on the bottom of these slides. If I cite a resource, I'll include it at the bottom if you want to look into it. What this is suggesting is that uh, people who identify as Black African American are more likely to die, not only die younger, but also to have diseases that are generally associated with being old in the white population. So white people are getting these age-related diseases after 65, but people who identify as Black African American are getting them before 65. And on top of that, infant mortality rates are 2.2 times higher for African Americans than for white Americans. Um, what this means is that uh, babies are, are 2.2 times more likely to die in black families than in white families. So you put all of these health statistics together. And again, this racist minority is saying, well, look, right, there must be biological differences between the races because these are consistent and they've been consistent for a very long time. Um, so how do we explain these differences? Think about that for a second. Hopefully in your mind, you're thinking culture, right? Um, the US has a history of African slavery, um, followed by segregation, Jim Crow laws. Um, and once those types of laws were, um, taken out, right, we're shut down, um, we still see intense structural racism. And we're going to investigate that um, in the next lecture from uh, this race PowerPoint as well. Um, lack of access to proper health care, lack of uh, proper employment, um, you know, lack of access to healthy foods and resources, um, things like that are going to cause um, marginalized populations, predominantly people of color, um, to appear to have a series of health issues or to start accumulating more health issues than the dominant white population is going to be. And it's not because people who identify as Black are predisposed to it genetically or biologically. It's because culture has failed them. And this gets even more complicated when we talk about discrimination, which is biological and felt biologically. So at an individual level, the experience of unfair treatment or interpersonal discrimination has a wide range of physical consequences, including elevated blood pressure, breast cancer, body mass index, right? Being obese, overweight, preterm birth, low birth weight, infant mortality, depression. Across the board, people who have experienced discrimination are more likely to have a, very, a wide range of health issues. And that's because discrimination is felt as stress and stress attacks your immune system. So it would make sense that populations that are heavily discriminated against would be experiencing more health issues on average than those who are not. A great example of this comes from um, a study of birth outcomes uh, before and after September 11th, 2001, when the Twin Towers um, were taken down by a terrorist attack. Um, the so-and-so examined birth certificate data for all California births during six months after September 11th compared to the same uh, period one year earlier. And they found that women with Arabic names and only women with Arabic names experienced a 34% increase in the likelihood of having a low birth weight infant after 9-11. So think about that for a moment. Why is it not all Arabic women? Because if it was biological and Arabic women were predisposed biologically to having low birth weight infants, then all Arabic women during this time would be, you know, having this increased experience, but only women with identifiable Arabic names. The suggestion here is, of course, that these women, because they were identifiable as Arabic and because 
um, people of Arabic descent, people who uh, of Muslim um, ethnicity were targeted heavily by the media and a lot of fear um, and violence started happening against those populations as a product of being kind of blamed, mass blamed for this event, right? Um, that those women were probably being harassed. They were probably experiencing discrimination in the healthcare system. Um, they were probably not getting what they needed. And as a result of that stress and discrimination, that stress goes to the baby and causes the baby to be born early um, or you know, not develop properly. Um, it's a great example of how discrimination has been directly connected with physical consequences. Now, one really important thing to consider here is that um, stress like these can actually be passed down from generation to generation. If you take my biological anthropology class, you'll learn about epigenetics. Um, you have a DNA strand, but then you also have things, signals from all over the world, all around you that are kind of coming in contact with your DNA and, and causing genes to turn on and off. Um, and those signals can actually be passed down to the next generation. So um, we have signals that the stress signal would be cortisol, that's your hormone, um, could be impacting DNA. Um, and you can then pass that down to your children. This would be a form of generational trauma, which is generally speaking, a social concept. It's like, you know, you're your grandparents talking about the Holocaust over and over and over and over again, kind of despite you not experiencing it directly, you have some of that trauma through the storytelling. But on top of that, you may have trauma from the epigenetic effects of your family that experienced this intense genocide, right? Slavery, Armenian genocide, Rwandan genocide, right? The, the infinite experiences around the world where people were enormously violently discriminated against and oppressed and that stress may be impacting those populations later. We need to know that. We need to understand that in terms of, especially in terms of treating the health issues. Because this race rationale leads to these inequalities physically, um, mentally, uh, and, and emotionally. Um, you know, when we start to associate race with physical and mental abilities, well, we can suddenly use that evidence as a means of stereotyping people, expecting things from them based on their outside appearance, which is incorrect, right? Certain people, certain races being better at sports or better at driving or, you know, better at math. Whatever this is, it, you know, whatever the stereotypes are, they're wrong um, because race is not biological. And it leads to a concept of, of social Darwinism, which is really what um, colonists use to justify slavery. And many people around the, U the world still use uh, to justify the oppression of certain populations. Social Darwinism is the idea that, you know, um, evolution is linear and things are getting better. And so the people at the top, white people with their fancy weapons and, and you know, their, their um, uh, resistance to diseases, they must be more evolved, right? Because as Goodman says here, so we use nature as an explanation for what we saw or seem to think we saw in nature. Those who were more aggressive or more intelligent white Europeans, excuse me, more aggressive white Europeans um, or more intelligent an irrelevant factor got things and those who weren't got less. So that becomes the continuing justification for taking over lands, for slavery, for competition. That competition was good and to the winners went the spoils. This is where Darwinism comes into play. And there's no need to feel guilt or anxiety about that because that's natural. It's a reflection of nature. And to the winner go the advantages of having been a winner, right? This is what Alan Goodman, um, who is an expert in uh, race biology, says about the use the false use and the misinformation about race as biology being used to justify inequality. Um, but social Darwinism is not, well, Darwinism from the perspective of race isn't real. Um, natural selection, evolution doesn't go like this, right? It kind of, it goes a little bit like this, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, for instance, dark skin was, was great. Um, in equatorial Africa. But as humans started to move north, people with darker skin would likely have died off um, after developing rickets and all sorts of other 
disorders. And so hopefully, um, you know, and ideally some people were born with mutations for lighter skin and now we're moving back up, right? That's really how evolution works. And it's not because the, the later versions are always better than the earlier versions. Um, what's good now is good now and may not be good later. We're going to see that actually quite a bit throughout the class. So this is where social Darwinism becomes dangerous because these racist ideologies are then used to justify oppressing people. Now, in the next lecture, um, we're going to look at more examples of inequality. We're going to start with health. Um, we're going to look at IQ score. Excuse me. We already covered health. We're going to look at IQ scores, wealth, education, crime, um, a, a bunch of different examples to show how this misinformation about race as biology, how the oppression of people of color and marginalized racial groups um, has led to massive amounts of inequality cross-culturally. Hopefully I have been able to convince you that race is not a biological concept in our species. If you have any questions about it, if you want to discuss it more, if you want to understand it a little bit better, please um, use the general forum, come to my office hours um, when they are available. Check out the notes at the bottom of the PowerPoints for additional readings. Um, otherwise, I will see you for our next section um, of race and ethnicity. Bye.